In the Shadow of the Valley by Maggot Mosh Pit Chapter 14 Martin trudged through the snow wearily, not really thinking about anything in particular. The suns shone pale light through the canopy, their heat barely felt by the travelers below. Kathresh called a stop. Let's rest here a moment. Martin sighed and sat down. His injured leg hadn't given him any trouble lately, but it still hurt when he walked. Bronze puffed and flopped down next to him, out of breath. <sighs> and last, a break. Arbalist took some biscuits from the provisions they brought from the cave and munched on them. You're quite out of shape for a wanderer. Shut up, Arbalest. He chuckled, then tossed the pack to Martin, who swigged some cordial from a flask. Then spotted Kethresh looking at him. What? I was just wondering where you lost some of your tail. Oh, huh. That's a very old injury. Got it before the war. He closed his eyes to better remember the tale. I must have been 15 years old or so. I had just got my apprenticeship at our forge, and it was my first day legitimately working, and I remember doing fantastically until I decided to rest for lunch. He took another drink. I sat on the hammering surface, and my tail fell right into the lava pool. Arbalist laughed while Kathresh and Bronze cringed. It was actually kind of funny in hindsight. It's not so bad, after I got used to bouncing myself again. Of course, the injured area got gray when I was 20, so that was unpleasant. Kier used to say... Martin faltered, and before anyone could realize why he did, Bronze leaned forward. Who's Kier? Martin's smile disappeared. Um, my mate. She's dead. Bronze instantly felt bad, and the group fell into an awkward silence. Even Arbalest looked sobered. Martin put on a smile. Listen, that was a long time ago. You don't need to feel bad for me. Arbalest nodded, then tapped his chin. How long ago? You don't look that old to me. Martin furrowed his brow. There are some things I won't tell you. Kathresh smiled mischievously. Can't be more than thirty. Bronze leaned in to study Martin's face. I'd say more than that. Thirty-four. Arbalist shook his head and crossed his legs casually. I bet he's an elder, hiding gray hairs under that cloak, Martin. Martin grumbled, surprised by Arbalist's accuracy. Jafraza, have mercy! I'm only forty. Bronze's face lit up in amused surprise. What? You're old enough to be my grandfather. You look great for forty. <laughs> Thanks. Most people don't live to thirty-five. Count yourself lucky, Martin. You're past due. I don't plan on dying anytime soon. There's still life in these bones. There was another silence, broken when Bronze suppressed a laugh and whispered, <laughs> Grandpa. He was hit in the face with a ropey root vegetable. After lunch, when the quartet was packed up and ready to go, Martin realized something. Guys, how are we going to get into the capital? Arbalist stopped for a moment. Well... I knew a few ways in. I did live there most of my life. Won't the city police recognize you? You're a convicted murderer. Where we're going, there are no police. With that, Arbalist marched off with purpose. Frey and Halen were not enjoying the festival. There was too much on their minds. Frey's paw was in his pocket, handling the vial of poison, while Halen was craning his neck, watching for the regent. He'll come up on stage and make a speech. Right? I'm sure of it. He wouldn't pass up an opportunity to stroke his ego. Good. One of the fire dancers climbed up on stage and held a conical device to her mouth. The fire dance starts in ten minutes! She rushed off as crowds of people began swarming around the stage. Frey turned away from the crowd, looking over at Halen. He was very apprehensive. Halen, calm down. The region won't suspect a thing. Halen smiled weakly, then wiped his brow. Listen, Frey, there's something you need to know. Yes? Halen gulped. Whatever happens, no, I really do respect you. Frey looked puzzled. Well, all right. Thank you, I suppose. Halen looked away. Miri dragged Redrick along, as she had been doing all afternoon, towards the stage. Come on, we need to get a good spot. Redrick tumbled along as fast as he could. I am much shorter than you. 
How am I supposed to keep up? Miri laughed, then crouched down. Get on. Redrick reluctantly climbed onto Miri's back, and with a shout, the two were off. Redrick clung to Miri's head for dear life, but he had to admit, it was kind of fun. Ah, I'm finally tall! <laughs> they laughed all the way to the stage. They couldn't get a good spot, but Miri was tall enough to see over the people, and Redrick had the best view of them all. The regent watched from the gates of the fort as the crowd gathered. It's time. His bodyguard stopped him before he could leave. What about the slave? If she's in the crowd, won't she say something? The regent shook his head. No, I have broken her will. Besides, I have instructed some of my soldiers to take her back here if she tries anything. The bodyguard nodded, and the regent began his walk towards the stage. Halen tapped Frey's shoulder. There he is! The regent wobbled slightly as he climbed onto the stage, the crowd quieting down significantly. His mane was combed and his clothes fine-looking. And, for the first time, he had a homely smile on his face. He stood tall and proud-looking before the canines and drew a deep breath. My friends, what a joyous occasion this is! All of us coming together for such a holy celebration! The crowd was flabbergasted. But the regent didn't stop there. Don't you all just relish this energetic air? I wish this holiday would occur every day, don't you? Miri was so stunned she didn't even notice Redrick had jumped off her back and was now clutching her paw. The regent shook his head. Alas, I know you all don't exactly think fondly of me, and I would like to apologize for my earlier behavior. I was simply acting and speaking how my people expect me to speak and act. The crowd began to murmur, a few angry voices speaking out. They were not sold on this idea. The regent expected this. Now I don't expect you to forgive me, so I won't take up any more of your time. But first, is it not customary to toast before the fire dance? Let us toast! The crowd had brought along an array of drinks to toast with, some of which were illegally alcoholic. But the regent, without a drink to toast with, found he couldn't begin. Frey pounced on the chance. Regent! The regent looked over, seeing Frey with a happy smile on his face, climbing the stage with a goblet. Here's a drink, and can I just say that was a lovely speech? The regent smiled back, accepting the tainted vessel. Thank you, my friend. And- Ripers! A shout tore over the crowd from Halen. No one knew exactly who or where it came from, as Halen had shouted from behind a nearby stall, but the effect on the crowd was profound. Sinner! Matt, you should be burning in hell! Yeah! Soon the crowd was shouting and yelling, some tossing their glasses and goblets at the regent. He shielded himself and roared over the din. What? Me, a rapist? What lies have you been fading on? His voice boomed, and it silenced the crowd. Who told you that I d did such a terrible thing? Who? This took the crowd off guard. People turned to each other and murmured, trying to find out who told who. An answer was not forthcoming, and the regent shook his head. Someone tell me what's going on here! A voice from someone in the crowd rang out. Well, I just heard that Martin Zorda was, uh... Assaulted, and you did it! There was agreement from the crowd. The regent looked genuinely surprised and confused. When did this happen? Not too long ago. Frey smelled something very fishy. He couldn't fathom what was going on, so he just stood there awkwardly, trying to cipher it out in his head. The regent then looked over the crowd once more. Did anyone witness this? Is there proof? There is! All heads turned. It was Halen. I saw what happened. You're one of the blacksmiths, correct? Yes, sir. I trust your word. Come up here. Halen timidly climbed up on stage. Frey looked at him with wild eyes, fear and confusion rooting him to the spot. What did you see? Well, sir, I was trying to visit my daughter at the fort, but I couldn't. The regent stopped Halen and looked him in the eye. Uh, next time you wish to visit your daughter, you are welcome, my friend. Go on. 
The crowd was dead silent. Halen drew a deep breath. It doesn't bear recalling, sir. I... I... was walking towards the exit when I saw a young Miri in the hall ahead of me. She had a basket of clothing, and she carried it into the linen closet. I followed her, but I was stopped by a soldier for a moment. After I was done with him, I decided to say hello to Miri. And then? W uh, well, I cracked open the door to a ghastly sight. I, I can't repeat it. The regent turned to the crowd. You all understand what he saw? A collection of nods and somber yeses came from the crowd. The regent then looked at Halen very seriously and asked, Then tell me, who was it that you saw violating Miri? Halen looked at the crowd, then at the regent. He then turned slowly to Frey and extended a finger. Frey! The crowd gasped. Frey looked at Halen and hissed. What the hell are you doing? I thought we had a plan! The regent grabbed Frey. A plan? What plan? Halen's eyes welled up with tears. The regent didn't even know if they were fake or not. He plans on poisoning you, s sir. The goblet. I went along with his plan because I, I feared him. The regent gripped Frey's arm tightly. So, thought you could kill me and quell any chances of anyone finding out your true nature, huh? Well, now the game's up. What the hell are you going on about? You committed mocked against Miri, not me! So you weren't trying to poison me? Well... The regent motioned with his paw, and a couple soldiers came forward. I think you should drink this, Frey. What do you say, good people of Frostblight? The answer was almost unanimously yes. They trusted the word of Halen, and now would finally see a feline brought to justice for the foul deed. Frey's further protests were muffled, as the regent had his muzzle held open. And among shouts of encouragement from the crowd, Frey was executed with his own poison goblet. Miri could only watch as Frey stumbled to the stage, gasping for a breath he couldn't catch, writhing in panic. Redrick was tugging on her arm. Miri, say something, please. She couldn't. The world was fading out too fast, blackness enveloping her senses. She fainted, saved from injury by Redrick who caught her and let her fall gently to the ground. Miri, Miri, please wake up. Set the record straight. It's not too late, Miri. Kay, get off. Both he and Miri were silently dragged off towards the fort by a couple soldiers, as the crowd cheered and rejoiced. The regent ordered Frey's body taken off the stage, and once again addressed the crowd. Perhaps when this war is over, we will have a more equal partnership. But for now, I will do as the king demands. That does not mean I will not bring terrible men to justice. And that does not mean we cannot have a fire dance! The crowd cheered, the dancers danced, and the regent chuckled to himself. <laughs> Things are coming up, Joe, at last. The march dragged on, and Tezar was bored. She marched out front with Zip. Zip stopped to quickly examine some tracks, then stood and continued. We aren't gaining any ground at this rate. Tezar shrugged. No big deal. True. I just like to feel that we're making progress. They walked for a while. Tezar felt something stir deep in her chest. She looked up from her long period of watching her own feet, only to notice the scenery had changed. It looked more colorful and vibrant. She felt strange as well. A sort of nausea that felt good rather than bad. She tried to shake the feeling off. She knew what it was. Zip noticed a change in her behavior. She wobbled as she walked. He put a paw on her shoulder. Tessar? What? You're purring. Uh, uh, I am not. The signs were clear to Zip. He had seen them before in his own mate. Are you pregnant, Tessar? She blinked slowly, then sat down hard in the snow, waiting for the morning sickness to pass. Please don't tell anyone. I can still fight. Zip sat next to her. If you're carrying a child, you risk its life by continuing the journey. 
Tezar found she couldn't growl much. I know it's selfish, but I can't abandon the mission right now. We're so close! Please! It's your choice to keep going if you want. Tazar and Zip stayed quiet and still until the strange feeling of euphoria and dizziness passed and Tezar was able to stand again. She sighed in frustration. I wish the signs of pregnancy were less obvious. Like, say if you just vomited every once in a while? That would actually be more convenient. <laughs> That's silly. There was a shout from nearby. Zip, Tezar! What are you two doing? Zip shouted back. Just taking a rest, Zik! Just before the rest came with an earshot, Tazar looked up and whispered back. I know what he would have wanted. Zik jogged up. All right, you two, get up! Zip clambered to his feet. All right, all right, we're going! Tazar stood, still a little wobbly, and followed the three brothers, trying not to fall behind too much. As attention shifted from her and Zip once again, Tazar placed a paw on her belly. She looked a little fatter than she did a month ago, when she wasn't on a dangerous mission, but sitting around in Frostblight Fort with Okara. She continued the march, a seed of doubt planted in her mind. Halen left the festival as soon as the fire dancers came on stage. He ran home through the dying light of dusk, bursting through the door and slamming it shut behind him. Tears rolled down his face as he stumbled into a chair. What? What have I done? Prefrasa, please, forgive me. The things he had done rang in his mind so loud he thought his skull might shatter. He heard the door open and tried to dry his tears. Troy. Troy ran over and hugged him. Dad, that was a very brave thing you did. No. I killed my friend, Troy. Hey. Shh, don't you cry now. He was a bad, bad feline, and you brought him to justice. I'm proud of you. He, 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 was, a, he was a good man. Troy pulled back, then pushed Halen down into the chair, spreading a blanket over him. You poor thing. You're talking nonsense. Get some rest. You'll feel better in the morning. She kissed him on the forehead and went about making some tea. Halen managed to calm himself down, the shock of what he had done wearing off somewhat. He looked over at his child, the thing he had worked so hard and done terrible, terrible things to protect. He took a deep, shaky breath. Don't you want to stay at the festival? I'll only go once you've had some tea and gone to sleep. After a few minutes, Troy brought him a mug of tea. Halen sipped the piping hot liquid. Thank you. She smiled, sitting down beside him as he drank. He placed the half-finished tea down on the armrest and took Troy's paw. Listen to me, Troy. I must tell you. There was a bump at the door, as though someone had collapsed against it. Both foxes stayed quiet for a moment, staring at the door. Halen climbed out of the chair and crept up to the door. Who, who is it? There was no response. Halen slowly opened the door inward, the body of Harimau causing it to swing open suddenly. He collapsed onto the floor his chest heaving with exhaustion. He held Rita in his arms, still out cold, dried blood showing through her fur. Harimau gasped. Help! Halen crouched down and felt Rita's pulse. It was strong enough. At least it was there. Troy, help me with her! Between them, they bore Rita to the bed and set her down gently. As Troy went to get some rags and water, Halen grabbed his tea and returned to Harimau who had propped himself up against the wall and shut the door. Halen crouched down and gave him the rest of his tea. Who are you? Harimau caught his breath for a few moments, until he found the strength to breathe. Captain Harimau of His Majesty's Army, at your service. A soldier? Wait, are you part of the army that's coming to liberate us? <laughs> Not anymore. They're all dead, or at least most of them are. What? That's crazy! We were tricked. An ambush. I escaped with a general's daughter. Harimau, as if noticing Rita's absence for the first time, tried to stand. Is she all right? <sighs> he slumped back down. Halen noticed the crimson stain on his side, soaking through his undershirt. 
He took Harimau's arm and led him to the nearest chair. Rest here. He left Harimau and joined Troy next to Rita. How is she? Troy finished applying the bandage to Rita's head wound and shrugged. I don't know. I think she has a concussion, but I'm not a doctor. She stood. I'm going to get the doctor. No. These are members of the army, Troy. If we make a fuss, the felines will discover us. Oh my. Then they can't stay here. They both looked over at Rita, who was breathing shallowly. She's in no condition to travel. I know that much. He walked out of the room and into the kitchen. First, he filled a large bowl with water and brought it to Harimau, who slurped it down with incredible speed. Then, he rooted around in a cupboard until he found a pouch of powder and filled another bowl of water. Harimau stood shakily as Halen passed, following him into the bedroom. Harimau sat next to the bed on a chair, reaching over to touch Rita's face. She's cold. She can't be allowed to die, I promise. She won't die. Don't worry. Halen took a pinch of the powder and held it close to Rita's nose. Suddenly, she sneezed, her eyes fluttering open. Hi, Mel? I'm, I'm here, Rita. You're safe now, don't worry. She placed a paw on her head. What happened? Where am I? Halen passed her the bowl and she drank. You're in Frostblight. Already? I ran you here. What do we do now? Harry Mouse shrugged. I don't know, Rita. He stood and walked back out to the main room, sitting on the chair he had occupied earlier, dragging it to the window. He looked out at the festivities. Halen joined him, but did not speak. Troy brought Rita something to eat, and she sat up. So, you're the general's daughter? Yes, I am. We suffered a great loss. I don't know if he's alive or not. I'm sure he is. Rita scoffed, but did not say anything. Instead, she munched on the insect meat she had been given. So, tell me about this place. Oh, there isn't much to tell. We're a smithy town, under the felines. They have a fort on the hill. Rita shuddered. So you're all enslaved? M more or less. You should be rebelling! Don't you want to be free? Well, yes, but we were relying on you to save us. I am sorry, then. Troy nodded. Back in the main room, Harry Mouse sighed. There's only one thing to do. What's that? We must join up with our army in the north and warn them of our failure, so that we may replan this attack. Halen was not up to date on troop movements or politics, but he nodded anyway. Sounds good to me. I can give you provisions, if you would like. I would. He stood. Rita? Yes? We're moving on. Halen pushed him gently back into the chair. Not before you've slept and I've had a look at that injury. Troy, you'd better get back to the fort. I don't want soldiers breaking down the door looking for you. Tajanka should be back soon to help. Troy nodded and ran over to Halen. It was nice seeing you again. I missed you. I missed you too. He patted her on the head and she ran out the door. Then he turned to Harimau. So? Harimau was asleep. Halen chuckled and knelt beside him, pulling up the fabric from his wound. It was not bleeding. He quickly retrieved some supplies and dressed the wound, Rita calling from the other room. Is he all right? He'll be fine. Must have been quite the fight. It was. I hope you don't mind me sleeping here. Halen chuckled as Rita fell asleep as well. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>